This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You lost all constitutional rights the moment you walked through that door. When the judge sat down there, I said to shoot 10 years at the Idaho State Penitentiary. You walked in that door, you was a number. And the inmate understood that. If you're out there, there's a pass in here, you can be in here and just lay down and do it. <laughs> Those inmates that were here in the institution during an execution, it had an impression on them that maybe uh, still with them to some extent. Maybe they don't think about it anymore, but it, it had a, an impression on them, I'm sure. They wouldn't let me out until I get back to stuff. <laughs> Seven months later, I get it back to them. That was one of the one of the problems we ran into. Is you had five or six guys that were sitting in a place smoking and joking and drinking coffee. Pretty quick, they'd have to plan in there to. to get under your skin some way or or try to figure a way out. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Behind Great Walls, a podcast about the old Idaho State Penitentiary and the men and women who were incarcerated there. My name's Anthony. I'm talking to Sky. How you doing, Sky? I am good. Very excited um, about the stories that we have today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I, you know, it's the finale episode of the season, and I had so many ideas for the finale, but I feel like... I chose one that I think we're going to hear a lot more about similar situations going on in our current time. I'm going to leave with something this holiday season that's not gory and gross, but (laughs) maybe something that's thought-provoking. Okay, let's hear it. So I am covering Tony Cornelius Phelan, number 5693. My sources, prisoner file from the Idaho State Archives, digitized Idaho Daily Statesman from the Boise Public Library, newspapers.com, Library of Congress Chronicling America, ancestry.com, the Warden's Biennial Reports, and a Wikipedia article on the Fraternal Order of Eagles and the Ancient Order of United Workmen. So, Anthony Cornelius Phelan was born on April 17, 1885, in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. And he went by Tony throughout his whole life. So I'm just going to refer to him as Tony throughout this episode. Uh, Goodlettsville is about 12 miles north of Nashville, and it's actually where country music icon Garth Brooks and his wife Trisha Yearwood currently live. So anyone into country music might know this place. Now, the Phelan family were involved in bookbinding and bookkeeping. His father, James Yarbrough Phelan, was a clerk while his mother was listed as a homemaker. And these Phelan parents had five boys together, William, Edward, James Jr., Robert, and Tony, the youngest. I found Tony as a young man several times in the social sections of the Nashville Banner, attending dances, Sunday school retreats, and parties with his friends. He was a pretty social kid, and in 1904, when he was about 19 years old, he appeared in the Nashville Polk City Directory working as a bookbinder with his brother William, just like his father before him. And the most adorable note I found came on December 17, 1908, in The Banner, when Tony was about 23 years old, and it says, quote, Dear old Santa, I am a little girl and have tried to be good and mind mama. Santa, I want you to bring me a little stove, safe, and some good things to eat. And Santa, please remember my little friend, Tony Phelan, and bring him a little rifle and a horn. Now, Santa, please don't forget us. I am, as ever, your little girl, Ruby DeMoss, end quote. (laughs) Aw, he was 23? Yeah, he was about 23 at this point. So Ruby was 19 years old when she wrote this note (laughs) in the newspaper. (laughs) Amongst what I imagine were actual young children's notes. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, there were. It's funny because it, it had all these like misspellings, and I think it was meant to just be this cute little thing. To, like a yeah, like a joke. Like, do you think that you could write like a little girl, get it published in the newspaper, kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there were so many little notes to Santa. It was the cutest little thing. I I've never seen one like that. And wouldn't you know it. Ruby Tomas and Tony Phelan were married about Aww. nine months later on August 29th, 1909, in what amounted to, quote, a surprise to many friends of both young people, end quote. Mm-hmm. So they were actually supposed to be married at her parents' house a few days after that, quote, but preferring a more quiet and surprise wedding, the young people decided to have the wedding sooner, end quote. So Ruby and Tony would spend the rest of their lives together. 
they had their first child together, a daughter named Virginia in 1911, followed by Olivia in 1913, Tony Jr. in 1915, and Clayton, their final son, in 1918. Now, Tony's mother, Rebecca, whom newspapers described as having, quote, a gentle disposition that had endeared her to a large circle of friends, end quote, died on November 12, 1911. Four years later, Tony's father, James Yarbrough, died. Tony had a well-adjusted childhood with plenty of opportunities and a vocation in the bookbinding and printing business, so nothing should go wrong. During the summer of 1916, he had his first touch with crime. He had purchased a horse, a sorrel mare named Nellie, a buggy, and a harness in Nashville from the Grocers and Merchants Bureau the previous March for $135, and he was making weekly payments of $3. And one day, uh, Saturday, he showed up with only $15 left on his balance, and he showed up to pay his $3, but nobody was at the place to take his payment. So he waited around and then left and decided to return the following Monday. And when he did, it was too late. They had actually put out a warrant to repossess the horse, the buggy, and the harness from him. <laughs> Tony actually paid off the horse to the clerk in the court and said he was good for the money and they set in temporary injunction on the warrant, meaning he could actually hold on to the horse. And it's just like fascinated me that this system of repossession was active 100 years ago for horses. You could have a repo man go and pick up a horse and bucky from, from somebody who's defaulting on their payments. <laughs> anyway, it seems like Tony won out and he got to keep this horse and bucky. I don't know when they moved, but I found from Tony's World War I draft card that he and Ruby were living in Phoenix, Arizona in September 1918. Tony worked at the McNeil Packaging Company, and I found several advertisements for that time period, and it appears that they actually sold typewriters, stationery, portfolios, and other like paper products, printing products at this company. I found a digitized book. It's fascinating. Everybody should check it out. It's called The International Bookbinder, Official Journal of the International Brotherhood of Bookbinders of North America, Volume 20, Number 10, for October 1919. <laughs> Tony contributed an article about the union organization in Arizona, and he talks about the many accomplishments and the improved numbers and even refers to his time in Nashville dealing with a scab who was, quote, just as rotten then as he is now, end quote. But the most interesting section deals with women within this International Brotherhood of Bookbinders of North America. And he says, quote, we often hear employers say, we have no experienced girl help. This is true, but why is it true? Is this the fault of the girl? The chief reason is that the girl is placed in an unimportant position when she commences work and is allowed to remain at that post indefinitely and given little opportunity to broaden her knowledge or become experienced. She is in no way to blame for this condition. Surely, the girl is not to blame, nor is the union. She cannot be expected to take up new work without the proper instruction. The forelady or foreman must assign her to more difficult positions, instruct her, and give her an opportunity to prove her worth. I think this is one of the great causes that we have no more experts in the field today, end quote. Of course, this is just under a year before the 19th Amendment and women receive the right to vote. So we have an idea of his kind of social beliefs and his values. Well, that's I mean, that's really interesting that, a you know, a man from a, ostensibly a, a rural southern state mm -hmm. um, and is promoting that. And that is one of the um, women's right to work is an issue that is being sort of pushed, not maybe not as equally, but certainly at the same time as the vote. And there's a whole thing as to after the vote, the movement splinters and so much of it focuses mm -hmm. around women's right to work. So yeah, that's really interesting. Good for him. Yeah, it's extremely progressive in his ideology. He actually appeared in the 1920 census in Phoenix, but I think that soon after that census, he actually moved to Boise before the end of the year and joined the Boise Trades and Labor Council. So he was within this kind of union workers' rights position. 
And in 1920, the Boise Trades and Labor Council were trying to establish themselves as basically an umbrella labor union in the city that would be the central hub for all the different specific unions. They organized a circus, a massive Labor Day parade, and even publicly wrote their endorsement for Daylight Savings Time in Idaho. Idaho wouldn't adopt it until 1967, but, you know, they were trying in 1920. Was he like a socialist? Was he a leftist? Do you know, was he part of any of the labor, AFL, CIO, IWW, anything like that? I didn't find anything along those lines. He was a devout Democrat throughout his life, Mm. but I didn't see anything further left than that (laughs) for him. Well, I guess he probably wouldn't say it if he was. Right, yeah. I don't know. This episode might have might have turned into a uh, yeah one of those stories, which we should cover definitely in the future. Mm. Southern Idaho at this time they did actually adopt Mountain Time by December that year. Prior to this time, Idaho is primarily on Pacific Time, so kind of interesting. Mm. The Trades and Labor Council also built booths for the Boise Business Women's Club during the Idaho State Fair, so that the clubs could provide information on the corner of 10th and Main to new visitors attending the fair in town, and they could also check luggage and things like that. They did have a mission to make it illegal for Japanese immigrants to own land or businesses in Boise, which cool. was, yeah, it. Yep. I mean... That was a sentiment across the country that would continue through the 1920s and lead to the Immigration Act of 1924. It's interesting that it's Japanese, though, because from 1880s, really, until it's usually Chinese. But, right, of course, any yeah. any any non-white and non-correct white is, is certainly seen as a threat. So, yeah, that's not unsurprising, unfortunately. Tony was serving as the secretary for the organization, and he published an article in the newspaper in October 1920 against the Boise Independent School District. So apparently they had sent out questionnaires that the Boise Trades and Labor Council saw as, quote, not of the business of the school board. They found this particular set of questions problematic. Quote, do both pupils' parents, when living, reside in the independent school district of Boise City? If only one of them, the other being alive, state the reason, end quote. And two weeks later, the school board published an article in response saying that the questions were not meant to pry into the parents' personal affairs, but to, quote, collect tuition fees, end quote. They wanted to make sure that every student's parents, particularly the father, were living in the correct district and paying the precise taxes and everything for their students. And around the same time, Tony was getting involved in boxing and wrestling matches in town, with smokers being held in around town, and his son, Tony Jr., was first appearing as a little ham during intermission bouts. And this was just like the cutest thing. Quote, the feature of the evening was a boxing contest between Tony Phelan and Willie Foy, both of the 45-pound class. (laughs) The boys are six years old, and much merriment was derived from their battle. Money was tossed into the ring by the spectators, and the boys were kept busy for several minutes picking up quarters and half dollars thrown to them, end quote. I mean, he was a tough little kid. In, In May of 1921... Tony Sr. was actually walking home for lunch and was crossing 8th and State Street when he saw his son riding his tricycle on his way to the grocery store for an errand when a car, quote, drove over the body of his little son. The little fellow did not see the car, which completely demolished the tricycle he was riding, but did not seriously injure the boy. Mr. Phelan does not blame the auto driver, whom he said was not driving rapidly, end quote. So Tony Jr. just narrowly misses being killed on his tricycle. Wow. And I just found all these little articles about him wrestling and being this little, like, funny intermission match in these Mm. smokers in town. Funny. Now, in the fall of 1921, Tony and the Boise Trades and Labor Council staged a citywide peace parade for Armistice Day. He published an article in the Statesman again as the secretary of the council that stated that, quote, war is either the product of ignorance or selfishness and should have no place in the history of any country claiming Christianity or enlightenment. And as long as wars continue so long, will there be want, misery, corruption, misunderstanding and chaos, end quote. The rest of the resolution calls for anyone else who believes this to gather and demand a limitation of armaments and wartime manufacturing. 
Tony was starting to make his way in the progressive community of Boise, and newly elected Boise Mayor Eugene Sherman, acting on a request from President Harding, established a committee on unemployment to advise the city government if a crisis were to arise. He noted that Boise's unemployment level was low, and he wanted to follow the president's guidelines and make sure that there was a group ready to act if anything dire were to happen. So Tony Phelan was tapped for the committee along with nine others. Tony was elected chairman of the cleanup committee and a city employment manager. And the group, nicknamed the Committee of Ten, had a division of labor for women, a house repair group, a farm committee, and the group made work by getting local wood dealers to actually stop using machinery and turn to Boise's unemployed to manually chop the wood. He asked repeatedly for Boise citizens to use up extra wood throughout the winter of 1921 to provide enough work, and several local businesses actually agreed to only use this manual labor to cut and saw the wood. Quote, the acceptance of this proposal shows the spirit of cooperation there is in Boise at this time, end quote. It was kind of an interesting concept. Now, Tony was also moving up in the ranks in the Boise Building Trades and Labor Council. He was reelected secretary in 1922, vice president in 1923. He was also a scout leader, probably for his sons, and he led several campouts. And in 1924, he was actually elected into the position of chaplain in the Fraternal Order of Eagles Lodge Number 115 in downtown Boise. And this is actually pretty high up in the ranks of the lodge. And you can still see that building downtown on the corner of 6th and Idaho Street. And you can still see FOE printed on the top of it. Now, besides the Eagles, Tony was also a member of the Boise Lodge of the Ancient Order of United Workmen. In 1929, he was elected the chair of Master Workmen, the head of this organization. Continuing his lifelong focus on improving working conditions for people, this organization provided a death benefit life insurance policy for members who worked in dangerous mechanical trades. So each member would pay a dollar, and if a death occurred, the money was paid to the member's family, and each member would again contribute another dollar in case another member were to die. And they had similar symbols and ceremonies as the Freemasons and other prominent fraternal orders of the day. Now that same year, Tony and Frank Downey opened up Hyde Park Dance Hall on the corner of 13th and Eastman. And I found all these different ads for dances, and uh, Duffy's Orchestra, a local orchestra, was performing there. They were performing all kinds of dance band music. And admission for the first dance was 60 cents for gents and 15 cents for ladies. It moved to 50 cents for gents and 25 cents for ladies during future dances. And other local groups like the Melvine Brothers Orchestra performed there for their Saturday night dances. So next time you're in... Hyde Park you can think about all the dances that were occurring here around 1930. I couldn't find if or when he ever sold this business or transferred it. Ruby kept busy with social clubs as well. She was a member of the Amicus Club and hosted meetings pretty regularly at the Phelan home. In 1931, she held this meeting on the study of European cathedrals and had a lecturer come in with stereoptagon pictures to look at the cathedrals in 3D. Have you ever seen seen those little 3D things? I think I know what you're talking about. These little spectacles that you wear, yeah. and then there's two photos, one for each eye, and it makes it look 3D. Yeah, They're, I think so, yeah. Can you imagine, like, in 1931, like, how cool those were? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, I'm, like, at home in VR, like, I looking know. at the pyramids. <laughs> I know. We Same were... concept. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting to see the, the technology. This is maybe calling out a classmate, but we had read this book about art. Like, it was actually this larger book about, like, culture in the mid-1800s. Uh, and one of the things that people went and viewed were these things called trompe l'oeils. And they are essentially paintings that were painted so realistically that people in the mid-1800s, like, genuinely didn't know, is this a photo? Like, is this literally a still life? Uh -huh. And that's how realistic it was. And someone in my class was like, how in the world did they possibly think that this wasn't painted? And I was like, because they didn't have television or movies or photographs? <laughs> like, it's so hard for us to understand, like, how cool that sort of technology is because we've advanced, like, because we have VR now. But back then, you know, because even movies, like, we have motion pictures now, but they're just right. 2D. And so, yeah, the idea that they would be probably one, colorized, and two, 
you know, have that 3D effect would be really cool. I love the history of technology and like... And culture and... And culture, yeah. That's, yeah, that's literally what I study, so... Right. (laughs) That's awesome. Tony was getting really involved in the local Democratic Party, and he actually was the chairman of the entertainment committee for the Democratic State Committee in 1932. And when Governor C. Ben Ross was reelected, the Democratic Victory Dance was held at Dance Land, and this was all organized by Tony Phelan. I think it was actually pretty soon after this election that Tony was hired at the Idaho State Penitentiary to work as the chief clerk in the warden's office. Now, Warden Jess would later explain in the courtroom, quote, The clerk was a pretty busy man. He was my advisor on financial matters, custodian of all prison finances, did all the shopping for prisoners, ran errands for the institution, and kept all accounts and records except those of the prisoners, end quote. He also stated that the clerk worked from 10 to 24 hours a day most of the time, and usually was given convict assistance for the work, and prisoners had access to the same records. Hmm. Now, you remember Tony Jr. getting hit by a car on his trike? Mm -hmm. Well, August 1933, while he was returning to his house near the penitentiary, he was hit again by a car and knocked to the ground, and it tore his clothes, and this car drove off down Warm Springs Avenue, and they never discover who committed the hit and run. But 19-year-old Tony survived. The Phelan family would continue to have a rocky road over the next decade as they lived and worked at the institution. In December 1933, Secretary of State Franklin Gerard read the warden's report by Warden George F. Rudd and went on the offensive. And at the time, prisoners were working on farms all over the state. And Warden Rudd noted that the daily cost of housing prisoners was about 75 cents a day. Franklin Gerard said, quote, the handsome figure of 75 cents per capita cost was not the figure arrived at by Chief Clerk Tony Phelan, who keeps the prison records, and Phelan's figures were not used in the report. Instead, the warden has adopted the Pythagorean musings of an inmate of the penitentiary. The exquisite diction and exotic phraseology in places might also lead one to suspect that outside help was available, end quote. Eagle Island Farm was noted as being operated at a profit, but Franklin Gerard stated, quote, that claim is merely a fairy tale, end quote. He stated that the prison was actually running on a deficit of about $70.15, and, quote, any farmer would be happy to know how any ranch could be made to yield that profit in 1933, end quote. It seemed that this was a note to solely the name of Warden Rudd and established a nice new position for Warden Ira Taylor, who would take over with a low bar to work against. Ira was from Ogden, Utah, and found wealth and business in Rigby, Idaho, and he had served as a Jefferson County representative in the state legislature and an Idaho district game warden. Under Warden Ira Taylor, the prison would see lots of improvements, but... Like most new wardens, he would be tested early on. In the spring of 1934, J.D. Bull Montana Young, serving 18 months to five years sentence for obtaining money under false pretenses, walked off from a fence repair gang near the prison. He actually hid out in some sagebrush until the evening and then then wandered off. And he was discovered a few days later. And Warden Ira Taylor aided in his recapture, where he was found sobbing in a friend's house in Boise's North End. Now, while Warden Taylor was actually out picking up J.D. Young, he left behind a trustee named Frank Lamar, who was working with Tony and the warden in the warden's office as a clerk. Frank was serving a life term for an armed robbery in Lewiston, and as Warden Taylor rushed out to pick up J.D. Young, he forgot to lock the safe in the warden's office. It's not a, it's not a great move. No. In that particular institution. <laughs> when he returned, Frank Lamar was gone, along with the contents of the safe, which is included about at least $125 in cash and checks. He wouldn't be recaptured until March 4th, 1938, about four years later. Wow. This would affect the books and put some questions in the minds of citizens as trustees were given pretty unprecedented access 
to the prison and to the warden's office. Regardless, the Phelans continue to be members of local social, fraternal, and sorority organizations in town. Miss Phelan was a member of the State Council of Democratic Women and the Supreme Forest Woodsman, and Tony helped the Boise Democrats host dances and parties and appeared in several articles and write-ups for his charitable activities in the community. They were amongst the most prominent citizens in town, and their children's weddings photos appeared in the 1930s in the newspaper. Warden Ira Taylor began running a campaign to become Democratic state chairman, a position that he actually won in 1936, and during that time he was given a leave of absence without pay by the other prison board members. He had a political career outside the prison to work towards. Warden Ira Taylor left office on March 13, 1937, being replaced by Warden William H. Jess on March 23rd. On about November 15, 1937, Former Warden Ira Taylor and Secretary of State Ira Masters told the new warden that there might be some shortages on the audit books. Suddenly, November 19th, 1937, Tony submits a letter of resignation to the new warden, William Jess. He was required to remain in office until the State Bureau of Public Accounts could furnish an audit of all the penitentiary records. And you might remember the name of William Jess from a previous episode, the one on Douglas Van Vlack. This was the botched execution that occurred the evening of December 9th, 1937, just weeks after Tony Phelan resigned his position. This would throw everything into the spotlight. Five days after the botched execution, Warden Jess barricaded himself in the prison, stating, quote, I intend to remain right here until I am properly relieved of my duties. I'm not surrendering until I have a receipt from the prison board for everything in my custody. When I get that, I'll be glad to get out, end quote. So he didn't want to leave the institution with any questions about money issues or anything else. Everything had to be in order before he left. The reason he felt this way? $789.25 was discovered missing in prison accounts. Any idea of how much money that would be today, Sky? I'm going to guess it is $1,500. Oh, man. 15000 What? 15159 I know. I was like... Uh, I guess I really should have. I should have recognized that because the economy is still recovering. So money yeah. means a lot more. You know, it was suspected that Tony Phelan's accounting work was the problem for this missing money. Upon further investigation, the amount actually grew to $4,226 that were missing or unaccounted for. This story just seems familiar. Right, yeah. Hmm. So we're looking at, that's today, that would be about $81,000 missing from the prison books. That's a lot. So Warden Jess actually brought his own personal findings to the board, and he did not want to be blamed for it. He actually had a notary sign a form that said, I have nothing to do with any of this missing money. Hmm. And Governor Barzia Clark began studying the audit report created by Chief Examiner Carl Evans, who wrote, quote, We regret that it is necessary for us to report to you The fact that the administration of the penitentiary during the period, insofar as the financial operations is concerned, has been exceedingly lax, unbusinesslike, and to a certain extent, corrupt, end quote. He would continue on that it was an abuse of the system that was in place, along with the methods that Tony and prisoner clerks were using for prison farm goods that made it almost impossible to keep track of the flow of money. Quote, in the absence of any data relative to the amount of products produced on the penitentiary farms, you will realize, of course, that it would be impossible to make a statement that all such products had been accounted for, end quote. While Warden Ira Taylor was on his leave of absence without pay to run for the Democratic state chair position, he continued living at the warden's house and he was collecting groceries and goods from the prison farm, as well as gasoline. This was kind of a gray area in the rules of a prison official that didn't look very good for them. During that time frame, Warden Ira Taylor gave Tony Phelan authorization, quote, to endorse checks, drafts, money orders, and inmates' checks, end quote. So 
We discussed this in previous episodes, but the position of warden was basically a political appointment. The longest serving wardens seemed to be men focused on law and order and corrections, and the ones with the shortest and the rockiest were those using it as a stepping stone for their political careers. Idaho during the 1930s was governed by Democrats, uh, C. Ben Ross to Barzia Clark, but many departments within the state were coming up short on their audits. On February 7, 1938, a grand jury heard a slew of individuals surrounding the trial, including butchers, poultry buyers, creamery operators, the chief examiner mentioned earlier, Carl Evans, the former Eagle Island prison farm manager, E.H. Kirkpatrick, former warden Jess, and chief clerk Tony Phelan. Two weeks later, the grand jury indicted former warden and current state chairman Ira J. Taylor and chief clerk Tony Phelan for embezzlement and misuse of prison money. They were both served two indictments together, including embezzling $999.29 of prison receipts, which totaled $1,653.91, and misuse of public money in the same amount. Ira received the same indictments in just his name, and Tony received the same indictments, plus another accusing him of appropriating $789.25 in state funds and using $963.31 in prisoners' personal funds. They also charged him with misusing $575.62 in public funds and, quote, knowingly keeping a false account concerning public monies and did fraudulently alter, falsify, conceal, destroy, and obliterate the accounts concerning monies, personal property, and checks received by him and in behalf of the state of Idaho, end quote. The state wanted Ira and Tony to go down one way or another, so they had all of these charges against them. Ira was actually ill and described as basically wearing a lounging robe and a quilt while he was being read these indictments and Mm. proclaimed that he was entirely innocent and had no intention of stepping down as the chairman. He was scheduled to go in for a surgery. Now, both men were released on $1,000 bonds, and Tony was required to post a second $1,000 bond upon arraignment the following week. Ira wasn't required to appear before the judge until he was recovered from his undisclosed surgery and physically able to stand before the judge. Now, more details of the story began to leak out to the press, and it was noted that many of the checks that Tony cashed at the bank for the penitentiary from sales of farm produce didn't actually make it into the state fund, quote, on the theory that the money could be used to meet penitentiary running expenses more easily than sending a claim through the sometimes torturous route of ordinary state procedure, end quote. Now, anyone ever work for the state? <laughs> it's kind of like that, but it's like that for a good reason. As mm-hmm. tedious as it is for every dollar to be accounted for and to go through all these different routes, you know, without these checks and balances you find yourself in a place like Tony did. So apparently Tony was just like, you know, it's easier if I just keep the cash and we use it for daily things here and not have to go through the state treasurer's office and then request the money back. And so he was kind of cashing these checks from the prison farm and not documenting them through the treasury. As they started to cull through other departments, they started to find other discrepancies. Uh, former Public Works Commissioner G.E. McKelvey and State Highway Bureau Maintenance Engineer A.D. Stanley were also indicted for similar charges, but this is for, like, so much more money than what the prison was suspected of embezzling. This is for, like, $20,000 that the State Highway Bureau is using. I have to note that in 1938, the old courthouse is being torn down. So the following trial and everything that occurs is in this little makeshift courthouse in downtown Boise. The prosecution, they were getting antsy. And in late February, they issued an order through the court in which the physician who provided the surgery on Ira was required to actually describe the illness that was preventing him from being arraigned and tried in court. And his family actually just told them that he was receiving a treatment for a sinus infection. I noted that the prison escapee, Frank Lamar, who stole money from the safe, he was actually serving time in prison after being captured in Boston, Massachusetts. 
Governor Barzia Clark, actually originally when he heard about his capture, demurred having him extradited back to prison because it would cost so much money to transfer him back. But now, with this trial in place, they sent a parole officer across the country to meet the Massachusetts officers about two-thirds of the way in Columbus, Ohio, and bring Lamar back. He actually would not be part of the trial in the end. In March, Tony demanded to see the audit reports and all the data that the auditors were looking at. He noted that the amounts were wildly different for each indictment, and he was, quote, unable to prepare a proper or any defense to the accusations until he is more particularly informed as to the facts alleged, end quote. I mean, that seems right. Like, what what data are you guys using against me? I don't understand. On March 5th, he actually pled innocent to the charge, and Ira Taylor was given until March 9th to plead, and also he pled innocent to all these indictments. The prosecution attempted to withhold the particulars that Tony wanted because in criminal cases, they actually weren't necessarily required to give that to the defense like they are in civil cases. But Judge Winstead noted in an opinion that he felt it was a case in which the prosecution should provide the bill of particulars to Tony and Ira before the trial. This brought the primary indictment against Tony to a cash check from June 9, 1937, while under Warden Jess, in the amount of $789.25 for the sale of hogs at Eagle Island. So that would be the case against him, is this one check for $789.25. On March 10, 1938, Taylor's lawyers fought to disqualify Judge Kelsch and Judge Winstead, both names that we come across regularly while doing research for this podcast. He wanted to stop them from hearing the case with a few pointed parlays. Under Idaho statute, disqualifying a judge actually didn't require any stated reason. But both these men had worked intimately with the judge in the past in their position as warden and clerk. And Judge Kelsch was a former law partner of sitting Republican Idaho Senator William E. Bora, who defeated former Idaho Governor C. Ben Ross when he ran against him for the state Senate chair in the previous election. And C. Ben Ross was the man who had appointed Ira Taylor to the position of warden. So Judge Kelsch quit back Quote, I think Mr. Taylor is mistaken. I have not the slightest prejudice against him. He would have been given a fair trial by me as I have given any man ever brought before me, end quote. But Ira and Tony were going to be fighting an uphill battle. So having a friendlier judge or one without so much background with them would probably benefit them. So Winstead and Kelsch actually discussed the matter and wondered if the governor could actually bring in an outside judge to handle the matter. And when Judge Winstead was handed the case for Tony Phelan, he said, quote, I thought I was going to get a vacation, but this doesn't look like it, end quote. So the judges kind of sorted out the matter, and the chief examiner who discovered the corruption, Carl Evans, was fired. He actually told reporters, quote, I was warned by friends that if I made a report on the penitentiary involving Ira Taylor or Tony Phelan, I would be discharged, end quote. And sure enough, he was. Winstead and Kelsch actually called on Judge Mile S. Johnson of Lewiston to hear the prison cases, while another judge, McDougal of Pocatello, would hear the highway cases, the other embezzlement case. Judge Winstead would get his vacation, in fact, and Ira and Tony had more time to prepare for their defense, as Judge Miles Johnson wouldn't be able to hear their case until the end of March. The temporary courthouse with two courtrooms wasn't enough as the trials began. Some hearings were actually held in the makeshift jury room. It was constantly crowded when the trial began. The trial for Ira Taylor started on March 28th and began with the judge dropping two charges against Ira Taylor right off the bat. Judge Johnson complimented the first day of trial with decent interactions, stating that he hoped that they kept, quote, the same good humor and mutual forbearance during these cases. Otherwise, you and the court may fall out, end quote. So on April 1st, the courtroom got heated. As the prosecuting attorney, Burt Miller, was in the midst of his argument, Judge Johnson barked out that he didn't want to hear the prosecutor until the state would explain how they were trying to charge Ira and Tony on crimes from 1934, which were out of the statute of limitations. 
So they could only be charged for two crimes within three years of the indictment, which would mean everything after February 21st, 1935. So two of the three cases against former warden Ida Taylor were immediately stricken, and due to the statute of limitations, the amount of money suspected of embezzlement went from $1,658 to $858. Hmm. Ira and Tony's joint trial was set for April 11th, 1938, and the jury was selected, and the next day, the prosecution provided checks signed by Tony Phelan that were not in any prison audit books. A guard we've mentioned before, Harry Powers, noted that he paid the penitentiary for a cow and a calf for $60, which did not appear in the prison record books. J.L. Driscoll, the executive vice president of the First Security Bank in Boise, brought in a form endorsed by Ira Taylor that allowed Tony Phelan to actually cash checks made out in Ira's name. The manager of Eagle Island E.H. Kirkpatrick was interviewed and asked about how he kept records at the prison farm, and he said they didn't. When he got a check for selling produce or a cow, he would turn it over to, quote, whoever seemed to be in charge. Sometimes it was the warden, sometimes the deputy warden, and sometimes the chief clerk, end quote. The defense put Ira Taylor on the stand as its first witness, but was only up for a moment before the defense actually asked for a recess to revamp their case. The prosecution stated that only the warden was allowed to perform the duties of the office, and he couldn't be replaced by any other officer. But State Senator George Donart, a member of the staff of the defense, stated that the duties of the warden, quote, are so multitudinous that no man or five men could be able to perform them. He necessarily must rely on others, end quote. The prosecution responded saying that as a public officer, say someone appointed to the Treasury office, they couldn't just hand over the keys and job positions to a clerk, quote, if he steals everything in sight, it doesn't make any difference because I didn't know anything about it, end quote. Kind of being a little facetious there. Most of the back and forth was to the effect that Warren Taylor was lax with the office and the accounting. Ira returned to the stand the next day and was grilled on how he ran the prison and he was shown checks that he explained that he did not sign. And he followed up by saying that he had, quote, granted the authorization in line with practice of long standing, end quote. Basically, every other warden had given their chief clerk the power to authorize checks. And so he kind of followed that line and did the same thing. This is only a half hearted defense for Tony. It was a stance that basically pulled the entirety of the blame from Ira Taylor and put it on Tony Phelan. Senator Donart further buried Tony by saying that. If there was any wrongdoing, it was done by Tony, as shown with the checks signed by him. The final closing arguments for the prosecution basically noted that they wanted the jury to convict based on not the idea that Ira had taken the money himself, but the shortages were due to, quote, slipshod helter-skelter methods of administration, end quote. The jury actually deliberated for five hours, and they found Ira Taylor guilty, mostly on the premise that the warden was strictly responsible for all transactions from the penitentiary, and a lack of knowledge was not a defense. He held a straight face, but uh, reporters noted tears running down his cheeks when he sat down after hearing the judgment. Instead of pronouncing a sentence soon after, the judge actually decided to wait until Tony's trial was over. His trial began April 18th, and he was being charged with embezzling $789.25, which was a check paid by a Boise butcher for 39 hogs raised on the prison farm. Eight of the 12 jurors involved in Ira Taylor's case were actually going to be in Tony's as well. Former Warden Jess took to the stand for the prosecution first to discuss the check, which he stated he had never seen and he had not authorized Tony to cash. The state treasurer, Mrs. Myrtle P. Ankling, took the stand next and was asked if she ever saw the money received for the sale of hogs in her office, which she said she had not. Tony attached the check with a remittal sheet, which was signed by Warden Jess, and filed it away in his desk for when he had time to turn the money into the treasury. Auditor James J. Fleming found the remittal and the check, but none of the cash, in Tony's office when they did the audit. Now, the money never made it to the treasurer, and Auditor James Fleming will be an important person in just a little bit, so remember that name. Tony took to the stand in his own defense and admitted to endorsing the check and cashing it. 
He said he put the cash in an envelope along with the signed remittal sheet and filed both in a drawer in his desk. He said, quote, In the press of other duties, I forgot it totally until the auditor discovered the transmittal sheets. Whatever happened to the money, I don't know. I hadn't time to go to town for several days, which was sufficient for me to forget the presence of the check in my desk, end quote. He admitted signing the check, but stated that the book that he kept farm sales info in was actually kept by a convict trustee named Charles Carson. Quote, I had to work with what help the warden would give me, end quote. He would also note that, quote, the convicts have had full swing out there for the last four or five years, end quote. Tony felt backed into a corner, even stating, quote, I had to handle practically all the warden's business. He handled very little business himself, end quote. The prosecution asked if Tony stole money, and he exclaimed, I did not. Tony also admitted that Warden Jess did file a memorandum absolving himself for the disappearance of this money because he was afraid the attorney general might attempt to prosecute him for the crime. Both sides made final arguments, and the prosecution stated that Tony was careless, and the defense argued that Phelan was no embezzler, as he would not have been so careless with all the incriminating evidence that he left against himself. He was sent out to the jury, who deliberated for one hour and 23 minutes, finding Tony Phelan guilty of embezzlement. With two convictions, the state dropped the other indictments against Ira Taylor and Tony Phelan, and Judge Johnson sentenced Tony Phelan to two to ten years at the Idaho State Penitentiary and fined former warden Ira Taylor $1,000. The judge lectured Ira that he should have known better and been more observant to the processes of the chief clerk in the office. The judge also stated these kind of sage words that I think are pretty important. Quote, I trust the time may come when the position of warden is not treated as a political plum and when wardens are not selected as a reward for political services and are not expected to be actively interested in politics. Wardens should be selected who possess executive business ability, whose experience, qualification, and character fit them for such a position, who are kindly yet firm, who understand that first offenders must be treated in a different way than habitual offenders, who interest themselves in the reformation of those who are confined in the institution, if reformation is possible, and yet who do not allow a hardened criminal to slip something over on them. It would astound the people of Idaho if they had listened to the evidence in the last case before me, which disclosed that things were simply allowed to drift at the penitentiary without any definite plan or policy or real head managing the institution. The court, from the evidence produced on the trial, finding no dishonesty in your acts, is inclined to leniency. You have, by depending on others to do acts personally required of you, brought greater punishment upon yourself than the court intends to inflict upon you, end quote. So that is why Ira is only given a $1,000 fine while Tony is sentenced to the Idaho State Penitentiary. So Tony is driven past his old house near the prison, past his old office in the administration building, and lodged in a cell at the Idaho State Penitentiary on April 22, 1938. Now, it's interesting to note that another clerk for the city of Boise that we covered in our live Tree Fort episode, Angela Hopper, was serving time in the women's ward at this time as well. So, Tony's intake. Tony C. Phelan, number 5693, crime embezzlement, uh, which was misspelled, interestingly. Sentence, 2 to 10 years. He's 53 years old. He's 5 feet 7 and a quarter inches tall, 166 pounds. He had a medium complexion, black hair, blue-gray eyes. He was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He had, was born in Nashville, Tennessee, April 17, 1885, and his occupation, of course, was clerk. In his Bertillion, it's noted that he was left-handed and he had a black birthmark near his right temple, which you can faintly see on his mugshot. Tony was actually given trustee status quickly and allowed to work outside the walls as an attendant at the water pumping station during his incarceration. He applied for a parole for the October Board of Pardons just a few months after arriving at the prison, but was denied. On the outside, C. Ben Ross was running for Senate against William Bora, and several fun political cartoons and full-page ads were printed showing him running from a roll of papers wielding a, a club with uh, state audits written on the side. It was, there were some pretty good uh, political cartoons back then. 
About a dozen of his appointees were being indicted for embezzlement and mishandling public funds. Oh, great. He uh, lost against William Bora and actually stepped out of the limelight and Idaho politics after that. Now, here's our little Christmas portion of the episode. On Christmas Day, 1938... Tony, along with 12 other prisoners, was given a temporary 10-day reprieve from the prison, so he was allowed to return to his family. He was required to return on January 4th, 1939, so he got to spend Christmas and New Year's outside of the prison walls. And fellow embezzler Angela Hopper actually got the same thing. She she uh, yeah. visited her son in Oregon, so just a prison-wide mm-hmm. Christmas reprieve. Yeah, so yeah, there's our little Christmas portion. So happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> In February 1939, Ira Taylor, who was reelected actually as representative in Jefferson County, called for a dismissal of his indictment and $1,000 fine. You know what? The charges were dropped against hmm. him. And over the next few months, almost all of the men suspected of embezzlement were acquitted or dismissed entirely. The one person to go down for all of the suspected corruption was Tony Phelan. Hmm. In April 1939, Tony went before the board again, and it was the prosecutor, Attorney General J.W. Taylor, that actually came in on behalf of Tony's release, and the Secretary of State and Governor, C.A. Batalfson, who agreed. Ruby, Tony's wife, went before the board and sobbed, asking for his release, and noting that that a job was waiting for Tony on the outside. So A.G. Taylor stated, quote, The situation is that there were a lot of other people involved in similar cases, and charges against them have been dismissed. I don't see why we should continue to hold him, Tony Phelan, in here any longer, end quote. And so Tony was met at the prison gates by one of his daughters, and he was described as pounds heavier and told officials upon hearing the news of his release, quote, Well, I'm glad it's over. I have a good job, and I'm going to get down to work. My age doesn't make any difference in the book bindery business, end quote. He told others that he felt he was the goat or the fall guy in this political battle, and that is why he had been incarcerated. I mean, that makes sense. Right, based on, yeah. Based on um, everyone else getting off. You know, I do feel for him. I think that he came into this position under a climate that he was doing what everybody else had done before him. But because of everything that happened with Douglas Van Vlack and with other politicians that had hired him being scrutinized, he got the brunt of it and he got busted and sentenced for it. Fortunately, you know, his sentence, it was short and he got a pretty cush job outside the walls and even a Christmas pardon. But he still had that, you know, that record Mm -hmm. now on his background. So Tony and Ruby and the Phelan children continued to appear in the newspapers in the 1930s and 40s for marriages, family reunions, and other social club engagements. And Tony and Ruby lived in the Belgravia building on the corner of 5th and Main in downtown Boise, actually where Ralph Golden, the police officer that we discussed in the last season, was living. I even found Tony in several of the fun, inquisitive cameraman articles that that we discussed in the Mark Maxwell episode. And his photo was snapped. And at this point, in about 1945, he was working as as a store manager for a local grocery store and asked about what he thought about price controls. And he thought it was a bad idea to remove them because he thought that there would be a huge run on the grocery stores. There wouldn't be enough products or uh, clerks to to stop all the people who would make a run and buy everything while the prices were still low. And then later he was asked about feeding starving people around the world. And he said, no, he doesn't think the United States should do that because he didn't think that other countries would do that for the United States, that every country it was up to them to have their own uh, rations prepared for years of famine finally at the age of 63 tony cornelius phelan died at a boise hospital following a long illness on june 9th 1948 he was buried at cloverdale memorial park in boise kind of to tie all this together you remember that auditor who found the envelope and remittance sheet but no cash in tony's drawer his mm-hmm. name was James J. Fleming. He was actually appointed clerk at the prison soon after this trial and after Tony was sentenced to prison. 
He was also a Democratic candidate for Secretary of State at one time and minister at a Methodist church in Blackfoot. But in August 1943, he was arrested on charges of embezzling $797.53 from the prison as the clerk. Quote, Fleming would accept checks made out to the prison for the sale of cream, produce, hides, and other products grown at the prison. Instead of depositing the checks so received with the state treasurer, Blaine said, he would deposit them in the inmate's account at the downtown bank. Later, when he was given inmates funds to deposit in the bank, he would pocket them to the amount of the deposited check, end quote. So Fleming pled guilty to embezzlement and was sentenced to from one to ten years in the penitentiary for a crime that he helped convict Tony Phelan for about five years prior. So I don't understand. He did not learn from the mistakes of others and just continued the same trend. And did he think that like this has been audited now? They're probably not going to check these books for quite a while. Like I don't. I I don't don't know what he was thinking. I I think it was the same thing that Tony was like, well, I guess this is how we've always done it, so I'll just continue to do this. And there just was not policy for the funds that were coming from the prison farms. There was the expected thing that it would go through the treasurer, but it was like everybody else is doing it. I'm just going to just keep cashing these checks and then using this like petty money for daily amounts and things. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is, Make sure everything is accounted for (laughs) or else you'll end up like Tony Phelan. I think we're going to hear with all the money that went out for COVID, we're going to hear a lot more of these cases of millions and millions of dollars being paid to people and that money just being embezzled. And right now there are cases in Idaho of people, you know, buying sports cars and things with this money. And I think... Over the next few years, we're going to continue to hear more and more of this. Cool. I love <laughs> oh. I love misusing government funds. <laughs> oh. oh, no. <laughs> it's so scary. Like, as yeah. a state employee, Seriously. like, I don't like spending any taxpayer money. Like, if I can, I will make do with whatever junky thing I have until right. it falls apart. Because I'm like, oh, I don't want to use my P card. It just, it frightens me so mm. much. I just... Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. Well, <laughs> don't take money that isn't yours. Yeah, and everybody watch watch out this holiday season. Mm-hmm. Um, watch out for mm-hmm. all the scammers and and everything along these lines. It's so easy to to fall into the trap. So account for everything. Audit your own books and yeah. make sure everything's good. <laughs> In 2021, the Idaho State Historical Society is celebrating 140 years of service to Idahoans as the trusted source in protecting Idaho's historical places and artifacts and sharing its stories. As a part of the commemoration, the Old Idaho Penitentiary is committed to bringing you 140 unique stories about the people who worked, lived, and served time at the site through this podcast and the events and programs scheduled throughout the year. The Capturing 140 Storytelling Program offers a unique glimpse at lives filled with hope and despair and the enduring triumphs and tragedies at Idaho's only penitentiary from 1872 to 1973. Stay tuned. First day on a ship was a swing ship. I reported to the ship lieutenant and they assigned me to cell house number four. And uh, I really wasn't even sure where that was at, even though they'd given us a tour. And so they had somebody take me down there and, and leave me off. And I relieved an officer in there, and, and uh, he came up and said, I don't know you, and I introduced myself. And uh, he stated something to the effect, oh, you're my relief. He says, uh, these are the keys. This runs the E-door to the, to the cage here, and this one runs lock boxes. Uh, up on the tiers, he says, here's your logbook, and here's a count sheet. you got to count to do in 30 minutes. We'll see you later, and he left. And there I was with a set of keys and a logbook and a, and a surprised look in my face. What do you do now? Fortunately, they had an inmate clerk in there that worked for the officer. And so he, said, he told me which keys ran which doors. And he went around with me, uh, or was trying to tell me how, how a count was conducted, and then went around with me, I think, on that first counterpart, way around with me until the yard sergeant finally showed up and helped me out. So it was a nerve wracking experience. Because you didn't have any formal training, you didn't know what to do, where to go, you know, didn't know how to take a count or any of these things. Can you 
back the next day. <laughs> I showed up to work the next day. When you have a family to feed, I guess that's what you do. What do you have for us today? So, I actually equally have a story whose trial is incredibly well documented. I am talking about number 4345, Viola Lowe, who is in for forgery. And I'm sure all of you who've been with the podcast are groaning inside. Ugh, another (laughs) forger. I have good news. The good news is I have never seen a forgery as well documented as this one. So for once, we are not going to have a short episode. But the bad news is the details of her personal life are very limited. So it kind of all balances out. I probably scoured Ancestry and Newspapers.com for close to six hours searching for her after she left the prison. And I'll get into why I couldn't find her um, a little bit later. So... Sources are the inmate file from the Idaho State Archives, Idaho Daily Statesman articles, newspapers.com articles, ancestry.com records, the Idaho State Historical Society reference series, nationalgeographic.com, a visitsouthidaho.com article on Wilson Butte Cave, blm.org, which is the Bureau of Land Management, not Black Lives Matter, and a couple sources on Wikipedia. So... She was born Viola Catherine Lowe in 1905 in Lewiston, Idaho, to Charles H., who also went by C.H., and Margaret Hennessy Lowe, and she had one older sister, Marguerite, who was three years older. By 1910, the family had moved south to Twin Falls, where C.H. owned a feed farm, and from what I can tell, her mother came from a really, really renowned family in California, and her mother's obituary described her as, quote, a member of one of the oldest families in Trinity County, end quote. And so, because she was really from what seems to be old money, it seems that Margaret raised her daughters in a very active social scene, very debutante kind of, you know, life. So from the Idaho Evening Times from February 24th, 1919, when Viola was about 14, uh, 15 years old, I don't have a month of when she was born, she attended a party for George Washington's birthday hosted by Miss Thelma Dawson. Quote, the parlor was decorated in red, white, and blue streamers, and the evening was spent in games and dancing, followed by delicious refreshments, end quote. Then the Idaho Evening Times on February 21st, 1925, when Viola was about 20, she and Marguerite attended a dinner party for a visiting Salt Lake City woman. Then in August 1925, from the Idaho Daily Statesman, it stated that Viola hosted an evening party with her friend Betty Bird, quote, with cards and later dancing for diversions, end quote. And young men attended this party as well. So there's tons of others, actually. These aren't just the only three. They're, these are sort of the three that I thought were kind of fun and and an exemplary of what she's doing at the time. And so it's clear that she's quite the social butterfly. And she's so well known and regarded that even in 1928, Viola and Marguerite had a friend visiting from Montpelier and the bridge dinner the girls hosted was reported in the Idaho Daily Statesman. So they're very well known, not just in Twin Falls, but even all the way out to Boise. And then Margaret also made sure that her daughters were involved in local organizations. So from an Idaho Evening Times article from March 8, 1922, when Viola was about 17, she met with several other young women for what the newspaper calls the Purple and White. And I'm not completely sure what kind of club this is, but purple and white were colors of the early feminist and uh, women's rights movement. Viola later does belong to an organization promoting professional women. So it's quite possible that Viola was involved in movement for women's rights because, as Anthony mentioned earlier, the 19th Amendment was passed only two years before nationally. So she would have been very familiar with the cause growing up. By 1926, she was part of the Business and Professional Women's Association and attended the state convention in Nampa as part of the delegation from Twin Falls. And then in 1927, the Idaho Evening Times reported that she attended the national meeting of the Business and Professional Women's Association in Oakland, California. So this means she's probably a big player, not just in the local Twin Falls chapter, but probably in the Idaho chapter uh, as well. And an article from the Idaho Evening Times from March 1929 stated she was elected to the position of corresponding secretary within the Twin Falls chapter of the club. At this meeting in Oakland, the Idaho State chapter won the national prize for, quote, the best exemplification of a state's industry, end quote, as the delegation apparently wore outfits representative of the state's industry. 
that's all it said. It didn't say what uh-huh. industry it was, but I enjoy imagining what that means. Like, are they are they dressed up as farmers? Are they dressed? I would imagine farmers. Surely, yeah. Idaho is agriculture enough of a state that they dressed. I, I I wish I knew. I wish there were pictures of what they wore, but <laughs> they won a national prize for that. So. So the reason that she was part of the Business and Professional Women's Association was because she had a professional job as the Assistant County Superintendent of Schools in Twin Falls County. And she frequently traveled out of town for her job. Marguerite, her sister, actually got a job as a teacher in Burley, and she had graduated from the University of Idaho in 1927. I couldn't find any evidence that Viola had attended college, but of course that doesn't mean she wasn't qualified for her job. So... Given all of this evidence, how much she's mentioned in the newspaper, she's clearly heavily involved, not just in the social scene, but in professional and social activities. It's probably safe to say that Viola Lowe was a well-known young woman in the Twin Falls area and maybe even well-known in much of southern Idaho as well. In fact, she was so well-known that the newspapers even reported when she was sick, which we saw actually with our previous embezzler, Angela Hopper as well. So from the Idaho Evening Times from December 27th, 1924, quote, Miss Viola Lowe, assistant to County Superintendent Charlotte Pond, is at home ill with the flu, end quote. And then about three years later, from the 28th of September, 1927, quote, Miss Viola Lowe, deputy county superintendent, was unable to be at work this morning because of a cold that she had contracted, end quote. And again, her name is so recognizable that even the Idaho Daily Statesman reported on October 12th, 1929, that she was staying at the Owyhee Hotel downtown. The social papers, like with Tony Phelan, I, yeah. oh, I love hearing their personal lives. And... Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's funny, again, like when they get sick, who necessarily <laughs> needs to know that? But that's just what, you know, what they did. Yeah. <laughs> so the good name, however, of Violo is about to be tarnished just two weeks later. So as we know, she's in Twin Falls. As I said, I've talked about Twin Falls a lot. Mm-hmm. There was one thing I found that I thought was interesting that I have not brought up before about Twin Falls history. And actually, I wrote this before I came up with the idea to read the front page of the newspapers. So I apologize I didn't do that one for this, though it would be interesting to know what is going on in early 1930 in, in Twin Falls at the time. But as I've mentioned before, Twin Falls County is home to some of the oldest prehistoric artifacts in the state and in the country. And only recently, archaeologists discovered a site near Cooper's Ferry that places humans there nearly 16,000 years ago, which is wow. unbelievable. My brain cannot fathom it. I was just going to say unfathomable. <laughs> cannot fathom it. My, I, had no. a, I had a friend who went to Turkey on vacation and she came back and she was like, I just can't fathom there because there were artifacts in these museums that we went to that were there from like 10 bc and i can't imagine how long ago that was and yet sixteen thousand years ago is twelve thousand years prior to this bc artifact in the turkey museum right i can't imagine it history is so crazy (laughs) i know seriously and just to think how much history is never going to cover. I get like this existential like dread when I hear about things like that. Listen, just, like... <laughs> imagine doing that for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? This nothing. None of this matters. It's doesn't matter. It's fine. So, totally, yeah. yeah. I'm used to the feeling now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the thing I always think about with history, too, and especially with 16,000 years ago or even, you know, 10 BC, that we find pieces of evidence and we piece it all together and we say, this is what happened. But in reality, like, how much are we ever actually going to know? Mm-hmm. And my, I have a friend who is in uh, archaeology, and, and I've been talking about this theory with a friend another friend. So the way that we do history, basically, it would be like the way that we've put together things from like ancient Rome or 10 BC or whatever it is you want to look at. We have such few bits and pieces. This would be like if in 2000 years, 
the people who are here are scrounging through all of our stuff and they find they keep finding our iPhones and our Androids and they they piece it all together and they say okay so clearly there's this little tab these tablets that everyone must have had and one that so this one with like the half eaten fruit on it this must have been you know the the tribe or the you know they were this was the deity was this like half eaten fruit and so they had these little blocks that were dedicated to it and the <laughs> other group was dedicated to this little green robot and and that's how they piece it together like that's what we're doing with history with 16,000 years ago it's fine so i i mean we are nothing in this like span of time <laughs> anyway with that existential dread near twin falls is what's called Wilson Butte Cave. It's a rock formation that looks a little bit like a bubble coming out of the ground. And here, archaeologists found evidence of native peoples living there between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago. And this is the earliest proof of peoples living on the Snake River Plain. And it also provides evidence for some of the earliest human existence in North America. Archaeologists are fairly certain that the cave was used as a base from which to hunt bison. And then we've talked about the history of Twin Falls quite a bit, so if you feel so inclined, um, I've talked about it in Season 2, Episode 5 with Barbara Singleton, also Season 3, Episode 6 with June Skinner, and that one was a little bit more about the Magic Valley Cowboys, which was the Twin Falls baseball team. So in 2019, the 2019 estimate, which again was the number I had when I did this research, it probably has been updated with the actual 2020 numbers, but the Twin Falls population estimate was 50,197. In 1930, around the time Viola was there and, and working as the assistant county superintendent, the population was only about 8,787. So, on October 29th, 1929, which is only 17 days after she is reported staying at the Owyhee Hotel downtown Boise, the Idaho Evening Times breaks a big story. Viola Lowe has been charged with forgery. But this is not like the other forgeries that we've seen where she's just signing someone else's name to a check or two. So this is from the Idaho Daily Statesman the next day. Quote, The school district order for $480 allegedly forged was written by Miss Lowe. The alleged forgeries total $3,585 and affect seven rural school districts in the county. So you did it to me. I'm going to do it to you. $3,585 in 1929. I'm going to say 20000 $56,436. No way. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. So as I've said, oh. I will tell you, I have never seen a forgery case covered the way that Viola Lowe's forgery case is covered. <sighs> Newspapers.com provided 124 newspaper articles with Viola's name in it. By the time you count the articles that came before or after the alleged forgery, because that was like 124 newspapers total, and so by the time you count articles that came before or after the date of this alleged forgery, there's well over 50 newspaper articles reported on her case. So oh, let's try to get into some of these details. <sighs> so about four weeks before this newspaper article comes out, at the end of September, maybe early October, Secretary and Chairman of Willowdale School District appeared at the Twin Falls Schoolhouse asking about a shortage of funds in the district. So from the Idaho Evening Times from October 29th, quote, canceled orders when examined showed that one order for $250 against the Willowdale funds had been charged. They pronounced this a forgery. Call was then sent out to all districts for examinations of their financial status and funds and several other districts have so far reported shortages because of alleged forgeries, end quote. And then it listed the affected school districts. So from Berger, $480, Haggart, $270, Deep Creek, $1,000, Willowdale, $250, Shamrock, $230, Mountain View, $270, and Mellon Valley, $150. Huh. And the alleged forgeries took place over the previous three years. Viola was arrested at her parents' home and held on a $1,000 bond, which her father paid. And so to be clear, Viola was being charged with forgery on only one check, that $480 check from the Burger School District, but it was believed she had forged the rest of them as well. Mm. So here's how the Idaho Evening Times explained how Viola might have been getting away with these forgeries. 
So in order for a school district to pay a bill, they had to get an order for a school warrant signed by the clerk and chairman of the board. The district then took the order to the county superintendent for countersigning. After countersigning, order was taken to the county recorder who issued the warrant payable by the county treasurer and charged against the school district funds. Orders would be accepted at banks with endorsement, quote, but must be taken through regular channels before being paid, end quote. And then the Times stated that because the warrants were well distributed among the districts over a long period of time, it took a long time for anyone to notice that the money was gone. So basically what happens is in order for them to get the money, they have to take it to the county superintendent because Viola was the assistant. She could uh, sign it and then she could also take it to the bank, if I recall correctly. So you may be asking why they thought that it was Viola rather than other people involved in the long and overly complicated process. And at Viola's preliminary hearing, the state relied mainly on a man named Charles Kingsley, who was a handwriting expert, to testify. So from the Evening Times from October 31st, 1929, quote, He testified that he examined the alleged forged document and that the same was made by the same person who wrote the other documents presented, Mrs. Rose J. Wilson, the county superintendent of schools, alleging that these other documents used for comparison were prepared by Miss Lowe and were Miss Lowe's handwriting, end quote. At this preliminary hearing, Viola pleaded not guilty, but her defense team called no witnesses and presented no evidence against the state. So it was decided that Viola's case should go to trial in the November 1929 term of district court, with trial scheduled to start on November 27th. So on November 23rd, just four days before the trial was scheduled to start, Viola's attorneys asked for a change of venue on the grounds, quote, that by reason of public prejudice against the defendant, the defendant cannot have a fair and impartial trial in Twin Falls County, end quote. So then they asked that the trial be held in any adjourning county. The defense attorneys presented 36 affidavits in support of the motion, but the state presented 59 affidavits that refuted the allegations. So three days later, on the day that the trial was originally supposed to start, Judge Hugh A. Baker denied the motion to move the venue, but granted continuance of the trial from December 3rd to December 16th. And Judge Baker stated he thought the case received equal publicity in adjoining counties, even if the sentiment may not be as strong there. And that's why they keep it in Twin Falls. So the Idaho Evening Times reported on December 14th that both the state and the defense were making final preparations. Quote, The state has listed 44 witnesses that may be called in the case, and the audit being made by Edwin Wilson, although not complete, is reported to be far enough along to render assistance, end quote. Jury selection began on December 16, 1929, and concluded the next day, and the state was able to introduce three witnesses that same day as the trial officially began. The chief witness of the day was again Charles H. Kingsley, the handwriting expert, who said that the writing on the orders was the same as on the other documents supposedly written by Viola. The state actually produced films, not movies, but like almost like overhead lays, basically, quote, so that comparisons between the two writings could be made overlaying, end quote. The chairman of the Burger District Board of Trustees, P.C. Hills, and the clerk of the board, Mrs. J.M. Pierce, witnessed that their names signed to the $480 order were forgeries. The defense cross-examined Charles Kingsley on day two, and Kingsley admitted that even though the handwriting on the forgery and other documents were the same, he could not tell if it was written by a man or a woman or the age of the writer. So it seems as if the defense's tactic was to admit that the warrants and orders were forged, but there was no proof that it was Viola who forged it. The defense then questioned Kingsley regarding the endorsement on the back of the order, the supposed forgery of the signer, which was the the name was M.P. Smith. And Kingsley, quote, admitted that there were many differences, but maintained his opinion that the same person wrote the endorsements and the exemplars, end quote. The state would then call George H. King, a handwriting expert from Denver. So after the, the state puts the second handwriting expert, it was then rumored that the defense would call two handwriting experts themselves to put on the stand when it was their turn to present the case. And the state rested their case the next day on December 19th after A.J. Beezer of the Deep Creek School District stated that the order made payable to A.J. Beezer was a forgery. They also heard from L.L. Patrick, a banker who said the forged A.G. Beezer warrant had been cashed by Viola. Another banker, Edgar Mussel, stated that she had cashed several orders that had been supposedly forged. 
George King, the handwriting expert from Denver, used a blackboard and chalk to explain how he reached his conclusions about the handwriting's matching. The defense tried to object to the illustrations, quote, as not being based on the record, end quote, but Judge Baker overruled the objections. So then, on December 20th, the defense began their case, and it wasn't a terribly large case. The main witnesses were Viola herself and her sister Marguerite. During her testimony, Viola said she had cashed the alleged forged order for a warrant, quote, but that she had done so for a man introduced to her as M.P. Smith, who had met her at the door of a local bank. She stated that the man she had known as M.P. Smith was the same man arrested by Secret Service agents at Lehigh, Utah, last December 5, as a counterfeit suspect, end quote. She said she had cashed warrants before this for Smith many other times, and that it was not wholly unusual for teachers themselves to approach her with cash warrant orders. Marguerite stated that she had been with Viola on one occasion when Viola had gone to the bank, and she had seen Viola come out of the bank and deliver some money to a man, identifying him as the same alleged counterfeiter as her sister. The defense then tried to bring in an alleged report of misappropriation of funds by former county superintendent Charlotte Pond and a Mr. Byington, who was a heating stove salesman, in the hopes that it would show that there had been a system of obtaining money improperly from school funds in the past and that the plans had been continued by someone else. But Judge Baker ruled this immaterial. And so the defense rested their case on the evening of December 20th in a night session of court. So the jury retired on the afternoon of December 21st. So here is how the Idaho Evening Times summed up the trial in the December 21st issue. Quote, Mr. Larson, who was the prosecuting attorney, compared for the jury the alleged forged order for a warrant with a genuine order for a warrant on the same school district, drawn with the same date and for $482, practically identical with each other. He stated that this showed to satisfaction that whoever had forged the order for a warrant had had the genuine one at hand and therefore had easy access to the records of the courthouse. He stated that Edward Mussel, L.L. Patrick, George King, and Charles S. Kingsley had identified Miss Lowe's handwriting on the alleged forged order, while the defense presented but three witnesses to refute this. The defense attorney stated in arguments that Mr. Kingsley, chief handwriting expert for the state, had spent two months searching for examples of Miss Lowe's handwriting that would compare favorably with the writing on the alleged forged order. J.W. Porter stated that in the two months, Mr. Kingsley had found 20 examples, or an average of one every three days. Even in these examples, Mr. Kingsley found many differences, even though he had known for what he was hunting and had picked examples to best suit his testimony, said the attorney. Mr. Porter had also stated that much of the state's testimony had been puffery. He cited that the names of the 45 witnesses appeared on the information and that only 8 or 10 had been called, while one of them had sworn he knew nothing of the case and was even qualified and serving as a juror. It was stated that Mr. King's handwriting illustrates on a blackboard were hidden subterfuge. In regard to Miss Lowe's having access to the old orders for warrants, Mr. Porter cited that, in most cases, the orders were countersigned at the superintendent's office and taken away immediately, while they spent considerable time at the bank in which they were cashed and later were filed by the county auditor. People in the bank or the auditor's office had more access to the orders for purposes of imitation than did Miss Lowe, he said, end quote. And here's a fun fact I found in the newspaper from December 31st. The fees for the 38 witnesses against Viola amounted to $1,510, or $23,770 in 2021. So the jury deliberated for about seven hours. They were, this was kind of a weird, funky way of doing it, but they were dismissed for deliberation at 4.30 Saturday afternoon, and apparently stopped deliberation, went to bed at 12.15 in the morning on Sunday, and then they delivered their verdict at 9 a.m. on Sunday. And the verdict, as we know, of course, was guilty. From the Idaho Evening Times on December 23, 1929, quote, Miss Lowe listened to the reading of the jury's verdict with the same stoicism she had maintained throughout the six days of trial. She appeared entirely indifferent and apparently bored by the entire procedure, end quote. Sentencing would take place four days later, after Christmas, on December 27th. She was sentenced to 1-14 to 14 years at the Idaho State Penitentiary. She and her lawyers immediately appealed to the state Supreme Court for the conviction and the sentence on two errors. They said the first was that the court erred in overruling objections to admission of other alleged forgeries the state claimed Viola had made. 
and they also said that the court erred in refusing to admit evidence showing that others had a system to obtaining fraudulent funds, quote, and that the name of the defendant was used by such person for the purpose of implicating the defendant and exculpating themselves, end quote. Which, they, that feels like two pretty decent points. So on file of appeal, her bond was set at $2,500, which her father immediately paid, and so she did not enter the penitentiary at this time. So after sentencing, the rural Idaho school districts affected had audited all of their accounts, and the Idaho Daily Statesman reported on January 12, 1930, that the losses totaled $15,683.07. Do you want to give this one a shot, or do you want me to just tell you how much it is? Oh, might as well just just tell me. (laughs) Uh, 252 and actually is 252,802 dollars and 67 cents all of these forgeries and losses were attributed to viola low but there's no definitive evidence that this is the case it is definitely it definitely seems like a scapegoat situation Mm -hmm. so on january 18th judge baker denied a motion to get viola a new trial and i think that she was allowed to remain out of jail on the bond as her lawyers worked on getting the case before the state Supreme Court. In March 1930, three Twin Falls rural county school districts instituted lawsuits against three Twin Falls banks who filled illegitimate orders. From the Daily Statesman on March 6, 1930, quote, in the suits filed Wednesday, no reference was made to any forged order. It was asserted that the banks illegally caused the county auditor to issue the warrants and that the banks illegally obtained the money, end quote. So Mellon Valley sued Twin Falls Bank and Trust Company for $250, Deep Creek sued Twin Falls National Bank for $250, and Shamrock sued the First National Bank of Twin Falls for $250. All three of these suits would be affirmed by judges later in the year. And so Viola formally filed with the Idaho State Supreme Court in June 1930, and the Supreme Court heard the case in October 1930. Then on December 1st, The Supreme Court denied Viola's appeal, declaring that she must serve the one to 14 year sentence proclaimed almost one whole year before. And so about 10 days later, she and her lawyers filed a second appeal to the state Supreme Court. And on January 3rd, 1931, the Supreme Court denied her second petition for rehearing. And so finally, she entered the Idaho State Penitentiary on January 5th, 1931. And so her statistics, Viola Lowe, in for forgery, age 25, height 67 inches, so about 5'7", weight 165 and a half pounds, build stout, hair black, eyes blue, complexion ruddy, born Lewiston, Idaho, occupation bookkeeper, received from Twin Falls, 1 to 14 years. Her Bertillon showed a couple of vaccination scars and a couple of moles, but that's really it. She was one of four women in the women's ward when she entered, though there were technically five if we count Mary Cromoy, but Mary wasn't actually in the prison at the time she was in Blackfoot. So the other three were Lida Southard, Mrs. H.E. Brooks, who was in for involuntary manslaughter, and June Gordon, who I covered uh, in season two. So... On January 7th, 1931, there was a letter to the public from Viola that appeared in the Idaho Evening Times. And so I'll read the whole thing. So it says, To the public, the courts of Idaho have finally decided that I must become a penitentiary convict. It seems that it is impossible under rules of law to go fully into a case like mine, that a defendant is confined within narrow limits in getting evidence before the court. I declare now, as I am about to leave to enter upon my sentence, that I am absolutely innocent of the charge. I am the unfortunate victim of a crime committed by someone else. I thought when I finished high school and a short business course that I was fortunate in obtaining the position as in the superintendent of school's office. It now turns out that it was the most unfortunate thing that could have happened to me due to the fact that being thus employed, others could use that circumstance alone to hide their own crime. I not only never forged a school order that I have been convicted on, but I never received a dollar out of any alleged forgeries, and I absolutely do not know who the guilty person is or who the guilty persons are. In order that this miserable charge could be fastened upon me, many false statements have been made. One has been that I had so much money above my salary that I purchased from time to time three or four fur coats. I have had two in the past seven years. My mother's brother furnished the money for my first fur coat, which I wore four years. I traded this quote in on my present one. Both of these coats have been of muskrat. 
It has been told that I bought one or more automobiles the five years I was employed in the superintendent's office. I nor any member of my family has ever owned an automobile. It is said that I bought two expensive rugs for our home, costing two or three hundred dollars a piece. My sister and I bought two rugs from the Hoosier Furniture Company on the installment plan. One rug cost sixty dollars, and the other one sixty-five. Since I lost my salary, my sister is still making payments on them. Every other charge that I understand has been made against me. I can fully explain as clearly as I have explained the above charges. Yet all of these things were used to create a public sentiment against me and condemn me before I was tried. I hope the good people of Twin Falls County will insist upon having a grand jury and panel to investigate this whole money business. Our family does not have the money to make this investigation. I think it is due me, as a girl who has grown up in this community, that this state and the county, in justice to the people at large, to the taxpayers of Twin Falls County, and to the school districts in this county, that an honest investigation be made and bring out the true facts. I know the whole truth will vindicate and restore my character. If signed, Viola Lowe. Uh-huh. Viola would never waver from her claim of innocence. I think, I don't feel like people who are really, truly, genuinely that innocent make those kind of claims. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll come out and say, like, I didn't do it, I'm being framed, but she has all of these reasons as to, like, I didn't buy these fur coats, we'd never have had a car, these rugs were not as expensive as everyone thinks. Yeah. So, there's definitely the rumor mill working overtime in this case. So in March 1931, Viola filed a writ of habeas corpus, which means she was trying to appear in court to argue that they did not have enough evidence of lawful detention, but this writ was quashed on the 30th of April, and Viola had to remain in prison. So probably around September, in an undated letter to the Secretary of State Fred E. Lukens, Viola asked for a pardon from the highest offices of the state, and this is her whole letter, quote, Dear Mr. Lukens, I am asking for a pardon from the sentence given me of 1 to 14 years. I have now served 9 months of my sentence. I am not guilty of what they have charged me with and have suffered more than I can ever tell you. We are still in debt to my lawyers, besides owing the county $1,500 they have filed against me for the prosecution. I am so anxious to get to work. I have lived in Twin Falls the greater part of my life and know that there are many people there who will recommend me, as I have always been honest and shall always be. I have a position offered me in California working in the office of Mr. Thomas Sullivan, a building and loan director. I will be glad to answer any of your questions if you wish to grant me an interview. Respectfully submitted, Viola Lowe." End quote. Mm. And so Viola's appeals to the Secretary of State and Governor finally worked. On October 26, 1931, G.P. Mix, who is the Idaho Lieutenant Governor, working as Acting Governor, granted Viola a full and unconditional pardon effective December 8th. And so she was released on December 8th, 1931, and she had served 11 months and three days of a 1-14 to year sentence. So she returned to Twin Falls to live with her parents, and finding her after this time, and finding her after her time in prison is difficult, and I think this was on purpose. I think she probably, her reputation, I think, really suffered from all of these charges, and so Mm -hmm. she had to get out. So here are the little details that I found on the rest of her life. Soon after her release, she moved to San Francisco, California, where her mother was from, and there she either purposely changed her name or got married because it is very, very difficult to find her. So her father died on August 3rd, 1943, after suffering from interstitial nephritis, which is a kidney disorder, um, and he had suffered from that for two years. And the Times News of Twin Falls reported there was some question over the administration of Charles's estate. Someone named Elizabeth Daly filed for petition for letters of administration on the C.H. Lowe estate, part of which was valued at $500. And I don't know who Elizabeth Daly is and why she's filing the petition, but it's in this article that we first see her called Catherine McGrew. So if you remember from the very like very first thing I said, Catherine is her middle name. So again, I think she uh. took that name to purposely avoid the stigma of her old name. Then her mother died in March 1946, and in Margaret Lowe's obituary, Viola is called Mrs. Catherine McGrew of San Francisco, indicating that then she was married. But finding a record that verifies her marriage was near impossible, and she she just really seemed to stay out of the spotlight. I really couldn't find her in records almost at all. 
So the only record that I could find that even could plausibly have been her is from the 1940 census, because this Catherine McGrew that I found stated she was born in Idaho in about 1910. That was about five years later than her real birth year, living in San Gabriel, California, which is in Southern California, different than San Francisco, where the newspapers place her. And then her husband is Donald F. McGrew, and they have a six-month-old son also named Donald. I could not find any other records on either Donald, so I honestly have no idea if that's actually her or not. It just seemed that because of the born in Idaho around 1910-ish seems very plausible it could have been her, but I'm not saying that it for sure is. She was so hard to find and severed herself so completely from her life in Idaho that her name appeared one last time in Idaho newspapers in the Times News on July 31st, 1952. Quote, the reunion committee of the 1922 graduating class of Twin Falls High School has issued a call for assistance in locating 25, quote unquote, missing persons, all members of the class, end quote. And Viola is one of those 25 missing persons. Huh. So, in 1964, there was a newspaper article from The Signal in San Clarita, California, that said a Mrs. Catherine McGrew from Twin Falls was visiting her son Jack and his family. This reasonably seems that it could be her. There is another Jack McGrew, whose mother's name was Catherine, that I found on Ancestry, but the difference is Catherine is spelled differently. Instead of K-E-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, it's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N. And this Catherine is born in Tennessee in the 1870s, and her son Jack died in the late 1950s. So this couldn't be the same Catherine and Jack that the signal was talking about. I could not find in records the same Catherine and Jack that the signal was talking about. And so Viola Lowe remains a missing person, as far as I found. There was nothing else that I could find definitive about her after she left prison. And so, yeah, I think I took a full day's worth of work plus half a day the next day trying to find her in these newspapers and in these records. And I couldn't find her. Huh. Yeah, that is our 4345 Viola Low. Well, good work, Sky. That's, uh, I'm glad you finally had some, like, in depth details on mm-hmm. a forger. Mm-hmm. I know, it's nice. It's nice to have details. We always unintentionally seem to cover very similar stories where Uh it's like, I think that these two people were the goat. They were the the patsy, the fall men. (laughs) Well, and so she's in in 31. And when he started to become clerk in 32, 33, is that right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they actually practically overlapped. So as as soon as she left, he became clerk. That's crazy. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) Oh, I love it. Yeah. So, huh. yeah, I mean, it's not a it's not an overly gruesome one like sometimes we do for our final ones, but we've had quite the season, so figured we'd probably end on a bit of a quieter note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let everybody uh, have a nice uh, holiday season without all the darkness. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so just, I mean, don't take money that isn't yours. That's the bottom line right there, yeah. Exactly. Whether it's forging or embezzling, just simply don't do it. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. We just appreciate, you know, the support we've received over this last year, all mm-hmm. the people who came to our live podcast mm-hmm. episodes. And, you know, it's it's just been really amazing. We've had so many new listeners, and yeah. we just really appreciate all of you tuning in and learning all this stuff and being just as fascinated as we are in this Mm -hmm. so please of course always let us know if there's something that you want to hear about or if there's a certain type of crime you want to hear about let us know send us an email at behindgraywalls at gmail.com or find us on our facebook or our instagram pages and you know we'll talk directly with you it's been a long season it's been a busy season and so we appreciate you guys sticking around and still i loving it as much now as I did the first episode we aired. So uh, just same. Yeah. But as long as you guys are, are listening and, and want to hear more and, and we, you know, are able to, I think we'll you know, definitely keep, keep giving it to you. So. All right, everybody have a great holiday season and remember to do your own time and remember to do your own number. Yeah. I will talk to you in the spring. Bye. If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. 
Not only do we get to hear your feedback about the show, but it helps others find us as well. If you're interested in finding out more about the podcast and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, follow our Facebook group at Behind Gray Walls Podcast. And we have a podcast Instagram as well. You can find us on Instagram at Behind Gray Walls Pod. 